Okay, hello. Um, so, I'm going to try to cover the stuff I didn't get to at the end last time and then talk about the new stuff from this time. Um, so, let's see. Oh, fortunately, I didn't erase this. So, you can see this was the stage that I got to last time. Right? First we had that pure state of nature, then what I call the more enlightened state of nature, then the savage state, which according to Rousseau is the best state to be in and the one that probably lasted the longest um, and that we feel, still find some people living in. And then uh, the next thing that happened was the invention, well, the next things that happened were the invention of iron, and then the invention of agriculture, and then because of that, the invention of real property. So, um, um, so according to Rousseau, it's only after the invention of real property, if that is, according to Rousseau in the discourse, the social contract seems to tell a different story, so uh, hopefully I'll get to at least part of that today. But um, according to the discourse, um, it's only after the invention of real property that civil society becomes conceivable or starts to become conceivable. And the reason is because it's only at this point that the state of war arises. Um, right? If the state of war means the known disposition to do battle, as Hobbes puts it. So, um, I mean, of course, uh, as I talked about last time, Rousseau agrees that in, in this stage, stage there can be conflict over matters of honor, but um, uh, but he doesn't think that can lead to all-out war. And I guess one way of explaining why not is that um, um, so to some extent you can compel honor by violence, right? That is, you can make people admit that you're stronger. <laughs> Um, but what you can't do is like, uh, take everyone else's honor by violence and like hoard it up. <laughs> um, that won't work. So there's a limit to where these conflicts can go. I think that's his thinking. Um, um. Moreover, I guess there's another part to this, which is that um, um, at this stage, uh, the savage state, um, so it's true that people have, built, have settled down and built huts, but, um, but if, Professor, did you yeah. write India on the board again? I didn't write anything yet. But can you okay. see my? No. No. All right. So I was pointing to stuff on the board. I wasn't writing it. Um, right, so I guess you couldn't understand what I was talking about when I kept saying this state, this state, this state, I'm sorry. Um, so, uh, but in this savage state, um, people have settled down and built huts, but, um, but if someone is trying to, um, attack you or control you, 
in some way, you can just leave. <laughs> right? I mean, go somewhere else and build a new hut. So it's only with, um, at this stage, people become tied down and they become tied down in two different ways. They become, the, at least the ones who are involved in agriculture, um, become tied to a piece of land that they can't just leave because they planted stuff and they're, you know, they're depending on the harvest. Um, but also people become tied down to occupations, right? Like the way this started act actually was that the people, that the production of iron supposedly requires so much specialization that some people just can only do that and they don't have time to also grow food for themselves or hunt or whatever. Um, and it's that in turn which gets agriculture started, according to Rousseau. So um, now again, even though the details of that are like historically wrong, I take it the point is interesting. So it's like war only really becomes possible when I guess you could say the first artificial chains are actually not laws, but like the chains that tie people to specific places and occupations so, so that now other people have leverage over them. Um, so now it starts to make sense to try to um, not only to, to try to become wealthier than other people, but to try to control them um or um attack them and take their stuff right again before if like if before someone wanted to attack you well they could take your hut although Rousseau says it's probably not worth the trouble but whatever else you have you just gather up and take with you um Right, so this is kind of a continuation of what Rousseau said about this pure state of nature way back then, when, why he said in the pure state of nature, you couldn't enslave someone because enslaving someone would mean constantly watching them. The second you turned your head around, they would just disappear off into the forest and you would never see them again. You wouldn't be able to sleep even, he says, right? Um, um, so, I mean, it's similar here in this state. People both don't have things that are worth fighting over and also can't be, like, imposed upon to stay long enough for you to fight them for whatever they do have. Um... And there's one other thing that, um, though, that, I mean, so, so far we're showing why it's cons like possible that there could be war uh, attempts or one person to conquer another or whatever in this state. But what makes it actually happen, and what makes it actually happen is, so this is impossible in Hobbes' state of nature, and Locke doesn't pay much attention to it, but Rousseau says that after a while in this state where inequalities begin to build up, and I won't go again into like his explanations for inequality, but he has Locke's explanation plus more why um, inequalities are going to begin to build up in this state eventually you get a permanent division between rich and poor. So um, the rich are people who have something to lose and they have a need for other people's labor, right? Like now they have more land that they can cultivate themselves. And on the other hand, you have the poor who would rather, who don't have anything to lose, and moreover, would rather take the rich people's stuff than labor for them, <laughs> right? So like, given it, so like the rich people are like, hey, I've got all this stuff. I'll pay you something if you'll help me out. And the poor people are like, well, that sounds like a bad deal. Why don't, just, why don't I just take your stuff? <laughs> um, 
So, um, so there's an inherent cause of conflict in this situation. Right? What originally was just uh, the idea that, oh yeah, you know, um, I should uh, keep on my own property and not interfere with other people's property because, uh, you know, we all have foresight. We all now understand threats and promises and whatever. Um, as the, the discrepancy between rich and poor builds up more and more, um, the incentives start to be out of step, basically, I guess you would put it, right? So like, um, again, the poor people don't have much to lose. So their foresight is, tells them, you know, there's a few rich people, we should just all gang up and take them their stuff. And um, um, without their stuff and without people to labor for them, they aren't a threat. Um, so basically, according to Rousseau, it's at this point when life has stopped being solitary and brutish that it suddenly becomes nasty and short, <laughs> right? Like up until now, things were relatively peaceful. Um, we didn't ha have all that nice stuff that civilized people have, which... Rousseau says, anyway, is at most a best a mixed blessing, right? I mean, he says we end up suffering these new things we invent. We end up suffering more from the lack of them than we enjoy the having them, right? So, like, once houses are invented, everyone really needs a house. They're not. They're, none of them are that much happier than they were in the pre-house state. But now, without a house, they're miserable. <laughs> so. Um, but in any case, it's, um, these people didn't have, for better or worse, they didn't have all that nice stuff that we had. But um, in return for that, they, they, didn't, they weren't living in a state of war. Oh, yeah, I'll say again. What I said was, I was, I was alluding, to, right, Hobbes says in the state of nature, life is solitary, brutish, nasty, and short. And I was saying that according to um, Rousseau, life starts off solitary and brutish, but not nasty or short. <laughs> and then as things pro progress, it gets less solitary and less brutish. Right? This is another way maybe of saying why this is the best situation. Here it's like, not solitary and brutish anymore, but it's still not nasty and short. Once real property is invented, it's even less solitary and brutish, but now it becomes nasty and short because people, the war of all against all that Hobbes predicts, oh no. Oh, for heaven's sakes. Am I doing the rap thing again? Yeah. You were for a little bit. Why does this keep happening? This didn't used to happen. I haven't changed my software or anything. This time it got a little intense. Really? <laughs> I can only speak for myself. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, but you still can't. I you still can't see me, and I still can't fix it. Right? All right. I just have to wait. But I'll keep talking. Um. So, um, right, so as Rousseau says, this is on page 78, emerging society gave way to the most horrible state of war since the human race, vilified and desolated, was no longer able to retrace its steps or get... Okay. Uh, so I have this setup to enable me to switch between three different cameras, whereas um, 
Zoom only allows you to have two cameras, but I wonder if it's worth it. It's causing so many problems. Well, I don't know. Anyway, um, I really need a hardware video mixer, but they cost like three thousand dollars or something like that, or more. I don't know. Anyway, um, sorry. So getting back to this. Um, what I was reading. Emergent society gave way to the most horrible state of war, since the human race, vilified and desolated, was no longer able to retrace its steps or give up the unfortunate acquisitions it had made, and since it labored only towards its shame by abusing the faculties that honor it, it brought itself to the rink of, brink of its ruin. Right? So what he's saying is, you know, um, this is part of like what he promised to explain about, sorry, that's on page 78. So, um, um, you know, what he promised a long time ago, like to explain why when the first person said, this is mine and put stakes around it, it was already too late for people to like rip them up, you know. By that time, um, we're already dependent on iron tools, so we already have to support people who can't support themselves, so we need agriculture and we need real property to make it work, and it's too late to go back. Um, so, um, so therefore, we can only go forwards. And this state is of, well, it's not really a state of war of all against all exactly. It's a state of war of the rich against the poor, basically. Um, but, uh, but it's a pretty, it's a state of horrible war. Um, so um, Rousseau, Rousseau claims it's at this point where people start to be in the kind of state of nature that you would want to get out of. Right now they have a reason to want to leave the state of nature, whereas in up till then the state of nature wasn't bad. There was no reason to leave it. Now they have a reason to leave it, but he also claims in the discourse, now again the social contract is going to make it sound different, but in the discourse he claims there's only one, I guess at least to say there's only one obvious way over, out of it. Maybe that's the uh, way of... of like um, explaining the discrepancy between the discourse and the social contract. But anyway, there's only one obvious way out of this state of nature, but it's a way that will help the rich, but will not help the poor. So it's basically going to involve the poor surrendering to the rich. Professor? Yes. Um, and this is still in the state of nature, correct? Well, it's, I mean, as I said, in, in part one of the discourse, Rousseau mostly calls just this the state of nature. But in part two, he, yeah, he starts to call everything where there isn't yet a commonwealth, where there isn't yet, uh, where we're not in the civil state yet, he, we'll call it all the state of nature. So he says about this, I mean, I don't know, maybe you should, I should make this a separate stage, but it's, it's, the, I mean, it's the necessary consequence of this stage. It's, right, it's the war. War of rich versus poor. So the state of nature has progressed itself into what you're writing. Right? Yeah, and, and Rousseau, at, oh, you can't really read it, but it says war of rich versus poor. And Rousseau, you know, says that, calls this like the, um, um, you know, the final term in the progression of the state of nature. This is the beginning of the state of nature, and this is where it gets right before we leave the state of nature. So in the end, he agrees with Hobbes that we leave the state of nature because we're trying to get out of the state of war. But he agrees without agreeing that the state of war is the natural state for human beings. It's only by this law. Hey, what was the last part you just said? 
Rousseau is able to agree with Hobbes that we leave the state of nature in order to leave the state of war, but without agreeing that war is the, is the natural state for human beings, precisely because, you know, the natural state for human beings is the pure state of nature. This is still state of nature in the sense that it's not civil state yet, but it's the result of a long and uh, partly artificial development. Thank you. Right. So, um, um, so again, Rousseau says that, um, um, the only way, or at least the only obvious way out is a way that's going to be to the advantage of the rich and the disadvantage of the poor. Because now, see, I mean, this is a problem that doesn't occur for Hobbes. Right? In Hobbes, in the state of nature, we're all poor. It's a war of all against all, and it's such that no one can be rich. No one has much at all. But uh, in the different like development that Rousseau has sketched out, by the time we have this war, the whole reason for the war is that some people have more stuff than other people, in particular more land, more real property. Now, if we stop the war now and agree to stop fighting each other, then the rich will be left with their riches and the poor will lose their hope of taking the riches stuff away from them. So, um, so according to Rousseau, this way out of the state of nature into the civil state, um, or into a kind of civil state, it's not, it do, it's not going to be the legitimate civil state he describes in the social contract. But the way out of the state of nature into um, a state where there's political rule of some people over others is going to be by the rich fooling the poor into cooperating against their own interests. Right? So that's what he imagines in the form of, like, he imagines it as like one rich person first invented this. Of course, that's, you know, I mean, uh, um, it seems like that would have to be an oversimplification at best, right? But this is the way he imagined it is like, um, there was one person, uh, what is it at the top of the page? A rich man pressed by necessity my necessity, finally conceived the most thought-out project that ever entered the human mind. It was to use in his favor the very strength of those who attacked him, to turn his adversaries into his defenders, to instill in them other maxims, and to give them other institutions that were as favorable to him as natural right was unfavorable to him. So, um, it's like a trick and the speech that he makes to them sounds like something out of Locke or Hobbes, but it's insincere, right? He says, um, let us unite in order to protect the weak from oppression, restrain the ambitious, and assure everyone of possessing what belongs to him. But he doesn't mention that nothing belongs to you and a lot of stuff belongs to me. <laughs> Let us institute rules of justice and peace to which all will be obliged to conform. So yes, everyone will be obliged to conform, but I start off with this advantage that I gained in the state of nature that you can't take away from me now, uh, which will make special exceptions for no one and which will in some way compensate for the caprices of fortune by subjecting the strong and the weak to mutual obligations, etc., etc., so, um, you know, the, uh, the rich makes it sound like a good deal for the poor, but Rousseau is saying if you actually pay attention, it's not a good deal for the poor. They would be better off staying in the state of war um, because, um, uh, you know, until they become the rich ones, and then, you know, then they, they should propose 
did we did we make this deal? <laughs> um, so um, so the answer to the academy's question. If by law of reason the academy meant not the rule of the strongest, but the law of reason, is inequality authorized by the law of reason? So the answer is um, um, no, this was not a rational decision. I mean, the rich person who thought of it was very rational, but the poor people who entered this compact were not rational to enter it. They were fooled into enter it, entering it. Um, um, so again, the answer is no, inequality is not authorized by the law of nature. But now the answer is, um, whereas, you know, the other version of it, right? I was discussing last time what Rousseau takes the law of nature to mean at the end, which is just the, the rule of those who are naturally strongest. And when we say that moral and political inequality is not natural or physical inequality, then like, okay, it's kind of true by definition that it's not authorized by the law of nature in that sense. So it's not very interesting. Here, he's giving an answer that is very interesting. If by the law of nature, you mean what Locke or Hobbes mean by the law of nature, namely the law of reason, then the answer is no. If we could go back and advise these poor people whether they should enter this state that's gonna make them permanently um, unequal, we would say, no, don't do it. <laughs> um, so, or I guess to put it better, they will, you know, leaving us out of the picture, if they consulted their own reason, we would tell them not to do it. So the way we live now is fundamentally irrational. It's unnatural in that sense. Um, then, I mean, there's more in this history in the discourse after this, right? So here, well, I don't have any room left at the, the board here. Yeah. Write it up here. We have the civil state, but then there's stages. Right, like, you know, Rousseau says at first they didn't actually have any government. They just agreed among themselves on certain conventions of like respecting each other's property. But pretty soon they realized that wouldn't work. And that's when they started to establish magistrates who at first were elective, but then they became hereditary. And then later it became illegal, absolute, arbitrary, tyrannical power, right? People just started exercising this power without, um, so to speak, even pretending that they were like uh, representing everyone's interests in the society rather than just their own interest. And that's the stage we reach in 18th century France, I think is the, um, subtext, right? The invention of absolute monarchy, um, the claim that it rests on divine right, which Rousseau puts in a very, right, he's like, uh, um, you know, by the law of nature, the people should always have the right to get rid of their rulers if they're no good. Thankfully, we have this revolution, revelation that tells us that rulers rule by divine right by which I think he means, you know, invention had, I mean, invention, religion had to be invented or twisted in such a way to, as to convince people that these absolute monarchs ruled by divine right in order to make this, this final stage go through. 
Um, so again, you can see how he might be called a forerunner of the French Revolution um, or instigator of it, right? Because if you read between the lines, he's saying um, this gross inequality we have in our society, inequality of honor, riches, power, and command um, is started off as a bad deal and got worse even in its became illegal even its in its own terms as time went on and uh, um, if you just consult your own reason you'll see that you have every right to get rid of it okay um, that is the end of what I planned to say last time are there questions about that before I go into the social contract? There's obviously a ton more stuff that could be said about this. I'm sure we, I mean, could have a whole course just about Rousseau or whatever. Okay, I'm going to go into the social contract. Um, so the discourse was published in 1759 and the social contract 1762 so it's only a few years later um, and of course it's you know three years is enough time to change your mind about everything if you're thinking all the time um, but still, it's a little bit surprising that uh, the social contract seems to contradict the discourse in various ways. Um, in particular, the social contract seems really positive about civil society. Right? Talks about how, you know, um, we haven't lost anything by entering civil society, and on the contrary, we've gained lots of things. And we should bless the day that we, you know, left that brutish state of nature. Um, now, as I mentioned, um, it's possible that there's really not much conflict there at all, or at least not as much as it seems like, because... Um, in the social contract, Rousseau is talking about, I mean, it's ambiguous, maybe deliberately ambiguous, but anyway, he's talking about a different way of leaving the state of nature than the one he talks about in the discourse. No one fools anyone into anything. Um, and he's talking about a different kind of commonwealth or city or state um, than we were talking about in the discourse. And um, again, I mean, this isn't so evident in the, in the reading so far, but a lot of times he is thinking of Sparta, I think. So um, if you look on page 167, um, if he's talking about the how great the civil state is, right? Chapter 8 on the civil state. If the abuse of this new condition did not often lower his condition to beneath the level he left, he ought constantly to bless the happy moment that tore him away from it forever, that is, tore him away from the condition which he left forever, and that transformed him from a stupid, limited animal into an intelligent being and a man. Right? So it's the if part is important. Um, if the abuse of this new condition did not often lower his condition to beneath the level he left, but often it does. 
right? So in the social contract, he's just like sweeping that under the rug, saying, if you forget that in real life, most of the time entering a state is a terrible idea because it it's, uh, turns out not to be legitimately set up and you it, it's, its structure gets abused in order to make everyone much more miserable than they were in the state of nature. But if you forget about that, <laughs> assume that didn't, doesn't happen, then you should bless it the day that uh, you left the state of nature to enter the, enter this happy new condition. So, like I said, when you when you factor in that if there may not exactly be a contradiction between the social contract and the discourse, but uh, in that case you have to say, well, uh, there may not be a contradiction, but there's been a real change of subject, right? He's ta not talking about the same thing anymore. Um, yeah, so I mean, he will say later on in the social contract that um, that there haven't been very many well constituted constituted states. I'm sorry about using the word state. I know that could be confusing because we're talking about the state of nature and the civil state. Um, I, it would be better to say there haven't been so many well constituted commonwealths. But Rousseau actually it does use the word state to talk about the Commonwealth. Um, he uses it to talk about it in one sense, as we'll see. But sometimes he uses it more broadly. Um, so, um, um, However, uh, even given that, it's, well, or maybe I should say in addition to that, it's a little hard to, to compare the discourse to the social contract because the state of nature at least sometimes seems to have changed from between the discourse and the social contract. Um, and the reasons for leaving it. Um, okay, well, let me say what the difference is and then I'll, I'll say how I think maybe it can be explained. So um, if, if you look on page 163, um, chapter, book one, chapter six. Oops, is that right? Oh yeah, book one, chapter, it must be at the bottom of the page. How come I... Oh yeah, here it is. I just didn't outline it or underline it. Um, I suppose this is how he starts the chapter on the social compact that starts the civil state. I suppose that men have reached the place where obstacles that are harmful to their maintenance in that state of nature gain the upper hand by their resistance to the forces that each individual can bring to bear to maintain himself in that state. Such being the case, the original state cannot subsist any longer, and the human race would perish if it did not alter its mode of existence. So, um, so this is really different from the reason that Hobbes or Locke or Rousseau in the discourse gives for leaving the state of nature. Right? The reason that people decide to leave the state of nature is not because they're afraid of each other, but because um, um, there's been some kind of exterior, at least that's what it sounds like, exterior obstacles to their survival that they can't meet on their own. 
Um, um, so when does this happen exactly? Oh, well, I erased the whole outline of the development in the discourse, but obviously this doesn't, it's not happening in the pure original state of nature of the discourse because in that state people would have no idea of making conventions or getting together to overcome obstacles. Um, they don't have any of those concepts. Um, they don't even really recognize each other. Um, so um, and moreover it would require a lot of foresight to approach things by making a permanent agreement as opposed to just getting together temporarily to overcome some obstacle. Um, I mean, it's a little hard to know because he doesn't say what kind of obstacle this we're supposed to imagine here. Is it like a natural disaster? What, what, or is it that the population has grown beyond the carrying capacity of the land we inhabit? Or anyway, something has changed. Um, and um, um, and somehow, again, like this isn't really explained here. It doesn't make that much sense in terms of the discourse. But somehow we're to suppose that people have got the idea of forming um, a commonwealth, even though they were still living um, a kind of peaceful, independent life. So it's not formed in a state of war, according to Rousseau. Um, now, so, um, so this new way of imagining the state of nature, so it's a, it's a situation where people are peaceful and independent, but each one individually finds nevertheless that they can't support themselves. Um, and the only way forward is to combine their forces with everyone else's. Um, So this changes the problem that um, that has to be solved, right? I mean, according to Hobbes and Locke, the problem that had to be solved that was making us want to leave the state of nature was um, that um, I want to get other people to lay down some of their rights, that is to give up some of their liberty, because their exercise of their rights is dangerous to me. Right, so I mean, in Hobbes it's this unlimited right, in Locke it's this theoretically re quite limited right, but it's still threatening the right to punish, um, to execute the law of nature. It's still threatening because we don't necessarily agree what the law of nature is. There's no fixed standing law we can consult. There's no umpire who can decide our disagreements. Um, so, uh, so anyway, according to both of them, the problem is to get everyone else to limit, to give up some of their liberty. And in order to do that, I'm going to have to give up some of my liberty. And the problem is how to arrange that transfer so I can be sure it will work and won't just lead to everyone taking advantage of me. Um, but for Rousseau, the way he's now imagining the state of nature, no one wants to give up any of their liberty. I, I haven't been given any reason to give up my liberty. Right? Again, we're imagining that other people are not really a threat to me. The, the problem is that, that each of us individually is not getting by. 
So what we want to do is figure out how to unite our forces um, without giving up any of our liberty. Um, so I think if you want to understand why this, he's now imagined the state of nature this way, um, and, um, um, why he's changed the question this way, um, it's probably best to work, so to speak, backwards from this fact, namely that according to Rousseau, it's impossible to renounce your liberty. So this is what he says on page 160. Um, Renouncing one's liberty is renouncing one's dignity as a man, the rights of humanity, and even its duties. Um, and um, this is the next page. Oh, here it is. Taking away all liberty from his will is tantamount to removing all morality from his actions. So this is an argument that I claimed was in Locke before, but in Rousseau it's like being much more explicit and it's being carried much farther and being um, carried through much more consistently. And the argument again is that you're not allowed to give up your liberty because giving up your liberty not only means giving up your rights, but also giving up your duties. And you can't give up your duties, right? You can't assign them to someone else. You're still responsible. So, um, Um, right? I can't just waive my, my duties the way you might think I could just waive my rights. Um, so, uh, um, therefore, Rousseau thinks that lay, giving up some of our liberty, you know, like, mutually or whatever um, is impossible, so it can't be the solution to any problem. <laughs> so if there's a problem that seemingly could be solved by doing that, it's really uh, it's an insoluble problem. Or I guess we should say it's a problem that has no legitimate solution. And, you know, that's why the people in the discourse um, who found themselves in not exactly the Locke or Hobbes state of nature, or closest to Locke maybe, but not exactly either of them, but anyway, as close to Locke or Hobbes state of nature as Rousseau's people get in the discourse, namely those people in the war of the rich against the poor after the invention of real property. So... Um, those people who found themselves in the state, in that state, didn't have any legitimate way out. The only way they could get out of it and stop the war was by the rich people to fool the poor people into cooperating. Um, so, on the other hand, if, so if you ask Rousseau, like, uh, you know, what legitimates the way our society currently is? His answer is nothing legitimates it. This is how, so to speak, it, it must have arisen. Or anyway, like, again, if you abstract from various other things, this is how it would have arisen. And it's, um, 
by fraud, basically, and therefore irrational, right? Someone was convinced to do something that they in all reason shouldn't do. But if you change the question and you ask, okay, Rousseau, well, um, what could legitimate civil a civil state? What could legitimate a commonwealth? He's going to say, well, we have to change the problem to one that has a legitimate solution. And I think that's what's going on here. So therefore, we're imagining this other state of affairs in which there is a legitimate way out. Now, how often does this other state of affairs happen? Maybe almost never. Right? Maybe it requires a really unusual event. Um, like um, one that somehow allows people to be reduced to the state of nature, but still have the concept of forming a commonwealth, but, you know, not be at war with each other or have an unequal, dis unequal distribution of property. Um, and, and then, you know, in that unusual situation, here is the agreement they could make. And in that situation, this would be a good idea. And now we'll see what their commonwealth would look like. And it turns out that it um, looks pretty different from our commonwealths, as we'll see. Um, so again, in a sense, there's no contradiction here, right? I mean, he's not being positive here about the same thing he's negative about in the discourse. And He's not even talking about the same state of nature or the same um, um, problem to which the commonwealth is the solution. I think, I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of one theme so far. And it's one of the questions, it was one of the, the prompts on the second assignment that, um, or involved in one of the prompts in the second assignment that like, if you want to know what the agreement is that, that begins the Commonwealth, um, uh, okay, I'm really glad that that's helpful that Alvaro is putting that stuff up. And I'm sorry that people get lost every time I read from the book. I don't know how to make that better, except maybe by having someone volunteer to put it up in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think it would be good to give a lecture without reading from the book. I think it's helpful if anything, maybe just like count which paragraph you're on. Because um, it takes some time trying to find out where you're reading from on the page. Yeah. Yeah, I could put, I could count the paragraphs and write little numbers next to them. But you guys wouldn't, well, you guys could also do that, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it is particularly bad with Rousseau because this edition doesn't have the paragraphs numbered the way our Leviathan did, um, or at least mine did. Um, Professor? Yes. Okay, so just to be clear, Rousseau wrote these two pieces of work where one he has feels a certain type of way, and then the one that we're going over, it's like he feels like it's almost like he's changed his mind about certain things or... Well, that's what it seems like, and I'm trying to explain that away, or at least, I mean, I said to begin with that Rousseau may not be consistent with himself in the way, or may not even be trying to be consistent with himself in the way Locke and Hobbes are, although he does say at some point in this reading, all my ideas are connected, <laughs> but, um, but, uh, yeah, so, but anyway, yeah, I was trying to explain why maybe it's not such a big change of mind, even though at first, when you, if you just finished reading the discourse and you, then you read the social contract, it really does seem like he's changed his mind about everything in those few years. Because again, the discourse ends on this, well, begins and ends really on this really negative note about um, any kind of political society. Um, and, uh, whereas the social contract, actually, it's interesting, the very first, the, like a famous line of the social contract, you know, man is born free, but is everywhere in chains, 
still sounds kind of negative, but as he goes, he starts saying how great an idea it was to form that commonwealth. So it really seems like he's changed his mind, but I mean, what I'm, what I'm saying is that he's talking about a different commonwealth. It's to, to exist, there would have to be a different set of starting conditions because it's solution to a different problem. Um, and what I was starting to say now is that, you know, again, if you want to know what are the contra contents of the initial uh, covenant that starts the commonwealth, when we don't, you know, there's a famous thing where Hume makes fun of this and says, like, where is this covenant written down? <laughs> on, what, on what leaves of trees or whatever do we find it passed down from ancient times? And, you know, so the answer is it's not written down anywhere. How can we reconstruct it? And what all these people do is basically reconstruct it by saying, well, why would you want a commonwealth? I say, well, what was wrong with the state of nature? And I have then, a question. Yeah, um, let me just finish the sentence. Then. So you need to make a list of what's wrong with the state of nature, and then the covenant that starts the Commonwealth has to answer to that list. So in order to make a, imagine a different kind of Commonwealth, Rousseau has changed his how he imagines the state of nature in order to generate a problem that can be solved this way. Yeah, so what was the question? Um... What would Rousseau have to say about prison? What would Rousseau have to say about prison? Um, uh, well, you mean in the social contract or in the discourse? So in the social contract, he eventually does talk about, um, so, I mean, what all, none of these people talk very much about prison because they all try to derive the legitimacy of the death penalty. And then they say, of course, if the sovereign or the executive or you know the magistrate or whatever can inflict the death penalty then they can obviously can inflict lesser penalties and then they just leave it at that um, um, but rousseau actually does say at some point in in part of his discussion where i mean he's actually disagreeing with hobbes and saying that when you enter the social contract, you give up your right to defend yourself. Um, he tries to explain how that's rational. But, in, but then he adds, so therefore you do subject yourself to capital punishment. But then he adds that uh, in a well-conducted state, there won't be very, the death penalty won't be inflicted very often because people, you know, you should only destroy the criminal when, uh, um, it's too dangerous to keep them and make them useful. So at that point, I think he's, you know, introducing, I guess, uh, really quickly in like that one clause, <laughs> he's introducing kind of two reasons you might have a penal system. Um, that is, on the one hand, because maybe the person can be reformed. So let's keep them and try and, you know, like keep them under watch until they can be reformed or something like that. But on the other hand, in the meantime, they may as well do something useful. Um, Thank you. So, you know, I mean, that, that, that's what he's saying like abstractly about justifying such a thing as a prison system, you know, um, like, uh, you know, would he predict that prison systems are mostly used for those purposes in the kind of political societies we have? No, because he thinks the kind of political societies we have are corrupt and abusive, right? So he's going to predict that all kinds of bad things will happen under, perhaps under cover of those intentions. 
I think is what he would predict, you know. So in other words, if you asked him, should we storm the Bastille? <laughs> Again, he was already dead before the revolution, but it, you know, it sounds at least possible the answer would be yes. Um, although apparently there weren't very many people in the Bastille at the time it was stormed, and one of them was the Marquis de Sade, <laughs> which um, uh, I believe that's the case. So who is someone who maybe, like, when people say we should do away with prisons, they might say, well, except for some of them like, like the Marquis de Sade. Um, well, in any case, um, all right, that's all I can say about that for now. Are there more questions? Uh, yeah, I have a question. I just want to make sure I'm understanding one of the points that you're making yeah. about this kind of contradiction Rousseau is making, but it's also not really a contradiction if you look at his wording. Um, so you said that for Locke, Rousseau, and Hobbes, they're showing that the Commonwealth must solve the problems of the state of nature because the Commonwealth, there has to be some incentive for joining it. But in Rousseau's um, discourse, he doesn't really have many problems with the state of nature um, until I guess you get to the state of war where there's all this inequality, but then he's still saying that it's still not a good deal for the poor to join into a commonwealth because it's just going to widen those inequalities. So is, in this framework, is he trying now to create a state of nature where there are like problems they can solve? I'm just like, I'm, I don't think I'm putting these ideas uh, together the right way. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's pretty much what I'm what I'm trying to say. I mean, like what I was saying about the discourse is, yeah, there's no problems in the state of nature or not many until they get to the to that stage of the war of the rich against the poor. And at that stage, the state of nature becomes intolerable. So in fact, you know, the poor don't like it either. But the question is, is there a solution to that problem that everyone would be reasonable to accept? Maybe that's, that's the, the best way I should put it. You know, only in that case could we say that the inequality is authorized by the law of nature in the sense of the law of reason. And in the discourse, by the time we get to that state, we're, to that stage where we want to leave the state of nature, there is no way, or again, like at least no obvious way, um, to get out of it on terms that everyone would be reasonable to accept. So there is no explaining a legitimate covenant that brought us out of the state of nature from that stage. And instead, um, Rousseau tries to explain how we could have left that stage by one side doing what was in their interests rationally and the other side being fooled. Um, but yeah, what I'm claiming is that here in the social contract, he's trying to explain how we could lay the state of nature on terms that it would be reasonable for everyone to accept. So in order to do that, he has to imagine a different kind of problem urging us to leave the state of nature. And it's a problem that didn't turn up in the discourse. And it's a problem, that, as I keep saying, it's a little bit hard to imagine what it was, but it's something that didn't pit everyone against each other, but rather like raised a common obstacle that no one could get over on their own. It just, it kind of seems weird to me because in the beginning he was almost hypocritical that these philosophers before his time were saying that they assumed things that you could only know after you've been in a commonwealth. And now that's exactly what he's doing, trying to solve these um, these questions that don't have rational answers to them now. Yeah, I know. I know what you're saying, and I and I and I emphasize that myself as a problem. What stage is this supposed to be? Where do they get these ideas? Um. So I think you know. I mean, the thought is something about the the, the, the like the divine Lycurgus, right? The 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 the, the, the super crafty lawgiver um, um, somehow gains the 
ability to completely erase the pre-existing political situation um, and start from the ground up. That was something he also mentioned in the discourse as an alternative. So if you imagine that happening, then you have something like a state of nature, right? Because the, the existing political arrangements are dissolved and you just have individuals again. Um, and yet now you can imagine them facing some uh, obstacle like the surrounding commonwealths are going to take advantage and invade us, right? Um, and if you just happen to be lucky enough to have Lycurgus on the scene, he can come and say, hey, look, there's, you know, you guys all know about contracts and whatever now. Let me suggest one that will get us out of this fix. So that, you know, I mean, that's the best I can do. But, like, I agree. I mean, I guess, you know, at best you can say if there isn't an inconsistency, Rousseau has not gone out of his way to make sure we see that. Right? He doesn't say, you know, oh, I said in my discourse this, but now I'm saying that because he just goes ahead and sees, says something that sounds inconsistent. So I'm not sure how to explain that, like what his aim in doing that would be. And I guess I would say that's a weakness in the way I'm reading it, you know, but um, yeah, that's the best I can do. Um, I mean, like, I, I mean, I think. It, it definitely is true that he's imagining the state of nature differently and he's imagining the problem differently and he's imagining the solution differently and the solution doesn't lead to the kind of political uh, arrangements we actually have for the most part. Like all that much, all that is true, but the question is why did, you know, so if all that is true, why doesn't he ever say, you know, and by the way, this is the, not the same as what I treated in the discourse. Maybe he did say that somewhere else, and I don't know. I was, I'm not an expert on Rousseau or really anything, you know. I mean, who knows? Maybe there's a letter he wrote or something where he says that. I don't remember anything about that in um, the Confessions. There might be something, but I've forgotten what the Confessions say. I don't know. Anyway, that's the best I can do for now. Um, um, Okay, so again, so now in the, you know, in the new state of nature, um, the problem is how to combine the forces without giving up our liberty. Um, or as he puts it um, in chapter, book one, chapter six on page 164. So it's the second paragraph on the page. I can tell you that in this case. This is the problem. Find a form of association that defends and protects with all common forces the person and goods of each associate, and by means of which each one, while uniting with all, nevertheless obeys only himself and remains as free as before. Um... So the new civil liberty that we gain by entering the civil state has to exactly replace the natural liberty we had before we entered the civil state. <laughs> okay. Um, 
Oh, okay. So someone says the mentoring the paragraph number was helpful. I'll try to do that if I can going forward. Um, um, so obviously, um, neither Hobbes's nor Locke's Commonwealth is going to be a solution to that problem. Um, again, the the whole point of those is to get people to agree to obey someone other than themselves. Um, right? That is, when they have those two stages, the stage where by un unanimous consent we agree to form a nation, or agree to form a, as, as Rousseau puts it, or agree to form a commonwealth, um, um, so in that stage, we form ourselves into an assembly, but that assembly only does one thing, basically. It, you know, in Hobbes' version, that assembly chooses the sovereign. And then it gives all its rights up to the sovereign, and it basically ceases to exist. Or in Locke's version, that assembly chooses the legislative, right? It chooses what kind of legislative power there's going to be and who is going to fill the offices of it and what the rule of succession will be. And then again, that assembly goes out of existence. It might come back, but only under extreme situations where the, um, where the government it's set up has somehow gone against its fundamental laws or whatever. Um, so, you know, as soon as that original assembly disbands, according to Hobbes and Locke, what we're left with is um, a duty to obey, and it's either to obey the sovereign, according to Hobbes, or to obey the legislative, that is, to obey the laws made by the authorized legislative power, according to Locke. And either way, we're um, obeying someone else. Um, so their solutions aren't going to work. What is the solution? And this is where something strange happens and um, like really paradoxical, um, which is that because so you might think, okay, so the problem in Hobbes and Locke is that they asked us to give up too much in entering the covenant, right? They asked us to give too much and therefore we gave up our liberty, which we're not allowed to give up. But actually, according to Rousseau, the problem is that we didn't give up enough <laughs> because the right solution. Now, I mean, again, it's not exactly the same problem. So maybe it's like comparing apples and oranges. But in any case, the right solution is for everyone to give up everything. Right? So this is the, um, this, these are the, or well, he says, first he talks about the social compact, the original compact having, you know, like clauses to it or something. But then he says, but they really all boil down into one. And um, this is the one. So it's on page 164. And this is the one, two, three, four, fourth paragraph. These clauses properly understood are all reducible to a single one. Namely, the total alienation of each associate together with all his rights to the entire community. And why? Why is that the solution? So the unique, because again, it sounds like the opposite of what you want. How am I going to solve this problem? Oh, sorry, you can't see the problem, but. 
I'm going to solve this problem, which was how to combine forces without giving up any of my liberty by giving up everything to the community. So this is the initial answer. In giving himself to all, each person gives himself to no one. And since there is no associate over whom he does not acquire the same rights that he would grant others over himself, he gains the equivalent of everything he loses, along with a greater amount of force to preserve what he has. Um, so the answer is that somehow, by giving up all rights to the community, um, I have, as Locke would put it, completely avoided giving them up to any private person. And um, um, every right I gave up to go in, I now assume again as part of um, the new body that we've created. Only now I have everyone else's force to back it up. So, I mean, okay, that sounds like something must have gone wrong there, obviously. I mean, it sounds like we must have got something for nothing. Um, I mean, yeah, you quote unquote got it back, right? But it's not the same as it was before. <laughs> um, you got it back, but only um, on the proviso that the community can do whatever it wants with it. So you don't really have it at all. And so you're basically in Hobbes' situation, only worse, because you've even given up the right to defend yourself, according to Rousseau. So, um, so the first part of the answer to this, to make sense of what he's thinking is, um, to realize that there aren't really the same two stages anymore. Now there will be two stages still, but the second stage we haven't got to yet. But Right for Hobbes and Locke, the first state is to um, agree to unite, and the second stage is I'll just use Hobbes terminology here because Rousseau is using it too. Choose the sovereign. And the sovereign is the person other than ourselves who we're now going to obey. And what we've given up is whatever liberty we had to give up in order to promise to obey the sovereign. According to Hobbes, almost everything. According to Locke, only some things. But in any case, we've had to give up certain liberty in order to... Um, so what we... What we agreed to here, we promised to give up some of our liberty. What part of it? You know, we promised to give up our liberty not to obey whoever is about to be chosen by majority rule to be the sovereign. Whereas in Rousseau, there's only one stage here. And the stage is for all the people together to become the sovereign. So, um, um, so first of all, it's important to keep this in mind when you read Rousseau talking about the sovereign. The sovereign always means the assembly of all the people. 
Um, there isn't any other form, legitimate form of government, according to these things. And, um, you know, um, so in other words, the person who is going to be obeyed here is the very person who's agreeing to obey, so to speak. It's a contract between all the citizen, I'm sorry, it's a contract between, this is the way he puts it in his terminology, between all the subjects and the sovereign, or between all the citizens and the state. <laughs> um, that is, it's a contract between um, everyone regarded one way and all the same people regarded another way. Um, and, um, you know, Rousseau argues in the first chapter of book two that there's certain limits on what the sovereign can do, and one of them is the sovereign can never assign its uh, role to anyone else. I mean, this is, you know, there was a version of this in Locke where he said the legislative, is, you know, the Commonwealth is dissolved if the legislative tries to give its power to someone else. Um, but, but, but this is much stricter, right? It's saying that initial assembly that formed by unanimous consent is the sovereign and it can do almost anything now, but one thing it can't do is um, assign someone else the role of being the sovereign, like a king or a, you know, aristocracy. Um, um, so it always has to be a pure democracy in this respect. Now we'll see, obviously he's, well, not obviously, but anyway, he is, he is going to say, there's also magistrates, there's also officers of the state, and he's gonna to have to explain where that comes from. But, um, but as far as the thing that's called the sovereign, it always retains its sovereignty and it's always in existence. And he's gonna say it has to keep meeting. The entire assembly of the people. Um, So, I mean, this is part of the answer to how it is that, pe that after this, everyone still ends up only obeying themselves and not anyone else. Um, um, let me go. So the end of chapter six and the beginning of chapter seven are where he talks about this. So, um, it's the bottom of 164. This is the second to last paragraph on page 164. If, therefore, one eliminates from the social compact whatever is not essential to it, one will find that it is reducible to the following terms. Each of us places his person and all his power in common under the supreme direction of the general will, and as one we receive each member as an indivisible part of the whole. Right, so again, it's a, like, like a contract between all these people and all these people regarded two different ways. Um, re, you know, regarded one way, um, all the people are agreeing to abide by the general will. And regarding the other way, the general will is agreeing to accept each one of the people as, as um, part of its generality. <laughs> um, and so the result is, and this is the beginning of chapter 7, and it's, I guess, the second paragraph on page 165. Um, each individual contracting, as it were, with himself, finds himself under a twofold commitment, namely, 
as a member of the sovereign towards private individuals and as a member of the state towards the sovereign. Um, but the maxim of civil law that no one is held to commitments made to himself cannot be applied here, for there is a considerable difference between being obligated to oneself or to a whole of which one is a part. So, I mean, that's true, of course, but that's just the worry, right? So in a sense, everyone has contracted with themselves, but only in a sense, because I've contracted as an individual with a whole to which I'm a part, of which I'm a part. Um, and we've contracted as a whole to um, all of our parts, Right, so like one direction was each private private individual is promising to obey themselves, regarded as a part of the general will. And on the other hand, all the people as a unit, what Rousseau calls the state, the, the all the people together regarded as passive, are agreeing to obey, obey whatever the majority of citizens decrees or legislates. So, um, so there's, um, so I mean, on the one hand, we're out of the absurdity of making a contract with yourself and trying to enforce it against yourself. But on the other hand, we're back in the question of, so haven't I given up my liberty after all? I've given up my private liberty um, to be ruled by this public liberty. Um, or when you look at it the other way, the public all put together has given up its collective liberty in order to be ruled by the majority of these private people and what they're going to vote. Um, so the, the basic answer to this, or the thing that Rousseau thinks can make it work, is a further limitation on what the sovereign, qua sovereign, can do. Um, and it, again, it's something that was in Locke, or that at least I claimed was in Locke, but it's much more explicit in Rousseau, and again, it's much more consistently carried out. Um, and it's a, a limit to what the sovereign can do. So, I mean, Rousseau lists several limits to what the sovereign can do. Um, uh, for example, it can't make a law that, uh, the sovereign itself can't break. Um, um, it can't obligate itself to do anything that would undermine the original compact that formed it. It can't represent, appoint someone else to represent its will. Um, and all of those are actually are kind of important, but the most important one is that it can't act with respect to any particular individual or particular case. Um, right, so this means that as in Locke, the sovereign is only a legislative power. That is, it can only make laws that apply equally to everyone. It can't um, directly concern itself with any particular individual or any particular um, problem that has come up. So, I mean, um, now, I mean, we kind of see how this, we can kind of see how this is supposed to work. So, like, if you take the fact that, you know, here's the whole territory of the new commonwealth. Now, um, do I still have my private property or not? So, um, 
in a sense, I don't. Because um, the Commonwealth, as I assigned all my rights over to the community when I joined up. Right? So including my rights to keep everyone off, off, else off this plot of land. But um, now suppose the community wants to use that right. So, right, this is what you imagine happening. I mean, this is like what you definitely worry about happening with Hobbes's sovereign. You, you, you know, you say, okay, I'm giving up. Well, actually, according to Hobbes, a sovereign it creates property to begin with. But in any case, a kind of Hobbes type sovereign. <laughs> um, so you say, I'm giving up all my rights to my property. Um, you know, uh, and uh, I hope you'll let me keep using it. But anyway, I need you to impose peace and order on all of us. So what, you know, you're afraid of is the next morning, once the sovereign has all the power, they're going to come knocking on your door and say, hey, nice house you got here. Uh, I heard you, <laughs> you, uh, you know, offered up the right to me to use it. Well, I'm, you know, I'm moving in. <laughs> Right? So, um, um, but Rousseau's sovereign can't do that. It can't do that not because of some, uh, um, authority that's going to, you know, interpose between us and say, hold on a second, you know, it's not fair for you to take his house or whatever. Um, I mean, there is no such authority, and even if there could be, I gave up my rights to my property when I entered the community. But it can't do it because it can't do anything about my private property or any private issue. So all it can do is make laws that are going to hold for everyone. Now, of course, um, if this sovereign were, let's say, a single person and their heirs, then that still wouldn't be very comforting, right? Because you would say, well, um, okay, they're going to make some kind of universal laws, but they're going to set them up in such a way that, you know, um, gradually small landholders landowners will be pushed to like you know sell all their property to the sovereign or something like that um but now remember that according to Rousseau the sovereign can only be the assembly of all the people acting by majority vote so um What he says is, as long as they all vote independently of each other, um, each one of them is going to have some kind of private interests. You know, so like my property happens to be next to a lake. So like everyone else wants to make a law against dumping your sewage into the lake. But I'm against that because my property is next to the lake. And it's very convenient for me to dump my sewage out there, right? So then there's going to be a million other special private interests like that. But Rousseau says that when we all get together and vote by majority, all those differences will cancel each other out. So everyone will end up... Um, uh, whether they know it or not, being part of expressing the general will, that is, what's best for everyone on the whole. And I guess you have to also assume that what's best for everyone on the whole is that everyone um, be secure in their, in their property, as long as it's not excessive anyway. Again, we've assumed that people, I think, we've assumed that people entered this state not divided into rich and poor. Um, it's a different state of nature. They weren't at war with each other. 
So, um, you know, I mean, we're thinking about what? Besides Sparta, we might be thinking about forming a Swiss canton, <laughs> right? Like a whole bunch of independent people with their pastures and their cows and whatever. But they're worried about getting invaded by the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So they're like, hey, let's get together and... Um, and remember, Rousseau, I mean, so Geneva was not this kind of democracy. Geneva had a, like a Senate and whatever. Not everyone had to vote. I don't know exactly how it worked. But I mean, but, you know, Rousseau was a native of Geneva. And he, like, I think he has this kind of Swiss democracy in addition to Sparta as his, as his role model he's working with. So, right, we get these people, none of whom are particularly rich together. They all have little interests that go different directions, but they all cancel each other out when they vote by majority. And so, oh my, I'm out of time, aren't I? Oops. <laughs> okay, I'll just finish really quickly. Professor, I'm yes. so sorry. I have one question when you're done. Okay, let me just finish, and then people who, who want to stay can stay here the question. Um, so... Um, Rousseau says, we'll be fine unless some of these people get together to form factions. And like the whole faction decides what its interest is, right? So we have like a primary election, basically, before the whole assembly meets to vote. In that case, Rousseau says we're going to be in trouble. That's kind of worrying, but anyway, I'll end on that note. Um, and now, what's your question? And who's who's asking the question? I can't even always see. Is that Tamara? Yes. Okay. Um, I didn't realize we were out of time either. Um, but I, my question was when you were talking earlier about how there are limits to what the sovereign can and can't do. You said the most important thing is that they can't act. Uh, they can't act to respect to any individual case. But I, I, I don't know if those are exact your words, but my understanding from that was they have to attempt to be as objective as possible. Am no, I no, correct in about, thinking that? It's not about objectivity. It's about the form their, their decision can take. They can't, and again, Locke said the same thing about the legislative power, but again, not as consistent about it maybe. That, um, that, they, they can't, like, the kind of thing that the assembly can vote on is not, um, uh, should Abe get to keep his house or should we use it for something else? Or should we give it to someone else? Or something like that. That is, they can't vote on questions that are about a particular individual or a particular case. Uh -huh. that, just, that kind of thing just can't come up for the vote. By the way, none of these people discuss who has the privilege of like proposing motions in assemblies, which, as we know, is actually really important. But anyway, so um, right, so they like they just can't decide cases like that at all. They can only decide cases that are put in universal terms. Whoever's house is next to a lake, they shouldn't dump their sewage in the lake. Okay, so common rules. Yeah, like rules that rules that are actually rules that that you know could come up any number of times, as opposed to rules that are really decisions about a particular situation or a particular person. Okay. This is true under I, our I constitution. I might email you for office hours, but okay. I, I have a, I'm a, still a little confused, but I. Thank you for your time, Professor. Okay, I just, I mean, this is this is a provision of the U.S. Constitution, also, right? Congress is not allowed to pass bills of attainder, meaning Congress can't pass a law saying Abe goes to prison. It has to be a law that just refers to people, citizens in general. So, okay, all right. Thank you. I'll see you next week. Bye.